Hello uh, and welcome once again to the Youth Ministry course. Um, hope you all are doing well. Awesome. Um, great. Uh, let's just uh, get into the chapter six where we stopped in the last class. Okay. I'll just quickly pray. Father, we submit this hour into your hands. Uh, Lord, everything that we learn, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will come and help us understand and give us the wisdom, the knowledge to uh, go about everything that you've um, called us to do, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, right. So in the last class, we looked at um, a bunch of challenges and we tried to understand the different generations. Uh, it Try giving them, you know, defying the generations um, from the 40s to the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, and all the way to the Generation Z, uh, Gen Z, as we call it, or the post millennials, are uh, trying to understand, um, you know, their lifestyle really and how it's led to a, a bunch of different trends, um, you know, that is being set in the societies and communities, in, in countries even. Okay, um, so today we'll continue with that chapter in chapter six, um, and we'll see how. Okay, now one of the things that we've learned is just understanding the challenges is not enough. It, it's it's, uh, it's the beginning. Uh, it's the first step to uh, you know finding. Okay, what can we do now? Uh, what what next? How can we uh, you know cater to this generation that is uh, being impacted and influenced by all these different trends or areas right and again it's very simple for at the moment uh, you know how we would cater is uh, you know without a doubt um, is having an effective uh, social media medium to engage with uh, your young people right so in impacting millennials and engaging them in uh, effectively one of the ways is the use of technology and social uh, media uh, right so if when we read the gospels most of the times we see where jesus would go to where people were right until people started following him uh, right and so now the crowd or people, most of them are on social media, and I think um, you know it's and uh, and the church, the global church, uh, you know, has been doing a good job in terms of engaging their audience online, and so uh, you know, and and that way I think we are doing a good job, and we can do better, uh, continue to do better. Uh, but uh, if you're in your church, if you're leading your youth ministry, or you have a youth leader who's leading a youth ministry, uh, you know, just check with that person about their strategy to engage the youth online. Like, what are they doing? Uh, what is their strategy? Uh, or, you know, what's the game plan, so to say, to engage the millennials or the Generation Z uh, on online? Because, um, it, as in, uh, again, I just not to re-emphasize this but then we know that uh, for example you take an example of a relationship this generation especially post uh, gen z they don't understand the difference between an online and an offline relationship um, okay if, if i say that so they don't really understand the difference between an online uh, and offline for them everything is the same right they think that they uh <sighs> Uh, they, they have learned to swim by reading about it online okay so these are the ways your hand has to be at a certain angle and your feet has to go up and down a certain angle at a certain force you've read about it and now i know how to swim uh it's uh, pretty much you know and also uh uh two individuals can have a full-blown uh, 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 a proper relationship online without even having met face to face uh you know like a proper romantic relationship uh, online is is a possibility in this day and age uh, and so asking yourself again uh, i think the church globally worldwide has learned if there's anything that we've learned through the pandemic is that uh, technology is the new sunday right technology is the new sunday um, everybody there is i don't think there was a single church on the planet that did not opt to go or at least tried exploring uh you know the online option um right the, the streaming option was always available but that was always secondary everybody you know would prefer going to in person uh, and whatnot so we uh, didn't really think it was important or even necessary 
for that matter. But uh, we've all learned, we've all adapted. The global church has adapted and kind of realized that, yeah, hey, technology is the new Sunday and it's here to stay. It's not going to change, um, right? It's And it's only going to advance. Uh, you know, if there's one thing that technology is going to do is that it's only going to get better and better and more advanced. It's here to um, stay. Okay, so uh, having understood that technology is powerful, we need to ask a few uh, questions as in, uh, are we communicating with our young people in ways uh, where they can engage back with us using technology? Uh, are you, uh, is there a social media platform where you are available to engage with the young people from your church and, uh, you know, and they engage back with you? Uh, it's uh, mo when we think of a social media or a page for that matter we, we the only thing that comes to our mind is is just producing contents and throwing it out there producing contents and throwing it out there that anybody can do that isn't it uh, the whole point of using uh, technology really well is making it engaging um, right how can you get them to connect with you it's not just that you know, okay, I know the bunch of things, I just want to share about it. Uh, it's not just one-way traffic, um, so that you need to ask yourself that, okay, create community in new ways using technology, create new educational pathways uh, online to help people grow in um, biblical knowledge um, and whatnot. So, uh, effective use of technology, uh, you know, uh, online, the online medium and social media is uh, going to be effective in your youth ministry. Uh, the second effective thing in where you can impact your uh, young people in church is uh, leadership. And it's not just uh, any leadership, it is relational leadership, right? Uh, relational leadership. Now, uh, I know there's a, a lot of talk about leadership, the importance uh, of, of being a leader and all this pressure of to the leaders being a good leader and if you're a good leader you need to be a better leader uh, and uh, you know there's always this thing but um, what I'm trying to say is that um, in the last decade or so um, the perspective of a leadership has changed a little bit to this generation uh, and so this generation prefers a more of a relational leadership versus the authoritarian leadership. Now, uh, you can read uh, all the books by John Maxwell. He is like the boss on this topic of leadership. Uh, you should at least read one book uh, of his on leadership. And uh, again, as mentioned, there's uh, there's no lack for resources on the topic of leadership that you can read on, that you can study on. Uh, and um, and so, yeah, uh, having observed, this is again, one of my observation based on my observation and also observation made by certain leaders worldwide is that the young people these days, they respond to a relational leadership, um, right? So, and not necessarily like an authoritarian leadership. Uh, there's an excerpt from uh, John Maxwell's book that I've shared an image in your notes. Um, Hope, hoping that you can look at it. Um, in it, it's this is a book called uh, "The Five Levels of Leadership" uh, from John Maxwell. Uh, it, uh, it relegates position or authority to the lowest level of leadership. Um, right. So let's let's just look at that uh, you know table of what uh, John Maxwell is trying to say. Um, so you you are now a leader. Okay, and um, so let's say you're, uh, let's, let's go from the bottom all the way to the top. Um, so you've been given this position of a leadership. Uh, first of all, leadership is not a position, but most of it uh, looked at it that way. So there's a position of leadership. With that, people will follow you because they have to. That's positional leadership. People will follow you because they have to. They, they don't necessarily have to like you, but they will follow you because they have to and they have no choice. And you are in, you've been given that a uh, position, you are in that position or that authority. So that's one level of leadership, it starts there. Um, the other level is the permission-based leadership where, okay, you are building relationships 
in here there's a slight change people follow you because they want to okay people follow you because they want to because they think okay there is some uh, accountability here there is some connect or a rapport between the leaders uh, leadership and those he is leading the team or the people that he is leading right and then the third uh, level is the production so it's it's very uh, results focused now uh, as well so people follow because of what you have done for the organization okay so they they see that you are the you are the first one to come uh, to to a program and the last one to go and they see your sacrifice they see that you know you are a man or a woman of principle you're a man and a woman of uh, value and character you're a man and a woman or man or a woman of integrity and all of that so they will see all of that uh, and then they will follow you because of what you have done or doing for the organization that's another kind of leadership you know you're saying an example uh, kind of thing and then there's the fourth level, which is the people development. Uh, so people follow because of what you have done for them. Okay, so you, you see again, there's a slight change from people will follow you for what you've done for the organization was the previous one. Now here, you're taking it up a notch by where, where people will follow you because of what you have done for them. Uh, you know, uh, and they see what you are doing. So, you, you know, you invest into their lives. You take time to understand them, getting to know their challenges. Uh, it, it's not about just giving orders to get things done, but you take time to nurture them, um, to equip them and walk with them. And they see that you are investing into their lives and then they choose to follow you. And then finally, it's the pinnacle. Uh, in this level of leadership is um, respect and then people follow because of who you are and what you represent people follow you because of who you are and what you represent it's very interesting from level one to level four it's about uh, doing right doing for the organization doing for the people uh, building relationships and all of that uh, while all of that is important it's very interesting to see that the pinnacle of the leadership uh, you know, stage is that they follow you for who you are and what you represent. Right? It, it boils down to your character, your integrity, your values, your principles, and, and whatnot. So, um, so uh, yeah, a relational leadership is uh, very important. Um, I, this is another book that I would recommend you to read. It's called Turn the Ship Around. Uh, Turn the Ship Around by L. David Marquet. Uh, so he is a retired captain from the U.S. Navy. Uh, he wrote this book. Um, so in, the summary of this book is available online if you want to. If you don't want to read the book. It's very interesting. You, can, you should. Uh, the summary is that when when David uh, was um, made leader or a captain of uh, of a ship um, uh, amongst the fleet of ships, his ship was considered to be the worst uh, ship. Uh, worst, it, it had like people of just no experience. Uh, they had there was no quality, uh, nothing. Uh, it's in the notes, Kong. You can look at it. Uh, turn the ship around by L. David. Yeah, it's in the notes, and I think it's in page twenty-nine. You can take a look at it. I've mentioned the name of the book and the author. And so, uh, basically, it's about how this captain David he, uh, you know, transforms that that people in the ship, and uh, you know, just by giving them freedom in terms of leadership, he creates these different levels of leadership. And so, uh, and then now that ship later goes on to become uh, uh, become the best ship in the fleet of the navy, and hence the book co being called the turn the ship around. It's nice play of words, isn't it? Um, so, uh, and he goes on to say that lead from authority, but not with authority. And they're saying uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Uh, it's another thing. So, uh, another. 
one of the quotes from his book he says is leadership should mean giving control rather than taking control and creating leaders rather than uh, uh, forging followers um, now there's a huge part of it that I uh, agree and then um, and then all, but the last aspect of it not as much uh, that is um, you know that we are to create leaders and not forge followers because um, where I disagree uh, I'm not sure disagree is a right word or if it's too strong of a word but uh, just a difference in opinion is that we need followers too um, as I mentioned you can just do a survey uh, or a study of the number of the leadership conferences that happens around the globe and the number of books on leadership uh, or the number of re articles or uh, resources on the topic of leadership versus uh, followership right our societies our communities our schools our colleges uh, our places at work uh, our workplaces everybody seems to only emphasize on this thing called leadership uh, but uh, being a good follower is very, very crucial. That's the beginning uh, of the first step of, uh, of, of becoming a good leader is you learn to become a good uh, follower. Uh, there is a book. Um, oh, gosh, I know the name of the book. Armor Bearers. There's a book called Armor Bearer. I forget the author, Terry Nance or something. If anybody's heard of that book, uh, share it. But it, it's a it's a must read book again. Um, the armor bearers, uh, the importance of being an armor bearer to the king for a season in your life, and then before you know before you get promoted. Um, so learning to serve uh, before you lead is again very crucial. It bo it 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 molds you, it builds you, right? And we see that in the life of David and versus Saul. Um, okay, so let's not go too deep into that. But so when we talk about this topic of leadership, it's very important. Good leaders are always ha have always been good followers. Um, and in our context of in ministry, now you can be a good leader only because you you are a good follower of the our ultimate leader of our ultimate captain, uh, that is Jesus. Right. So uh, there's two effective things. Um, you know. One is effective, uh, uh, you know, strategy for your online and social media audience, and uh, being a relational leader uh, is very crucial. Okay. Uh, another thing is um, is having effective uh, program and events. Now we'll talk about the program and events in youth ministry. Uh, earlier in chapter three, we looked at, um, you know, we have these five different audiences, right? Uh, we have five different purposes um, from worship ministry, uh, worship ministry, evangelism, uh, fel uh, fellowship, and uh, you know, just baptizing them, um, bringing them into the family. So we have all these different purposes, and we can't accomplish or achieve all of these five purposes in one event or one program. And so we choose to cater uh, or design strategically one event or one program to a certain audience. Okay, uh, what is important is, uh, you know, while you do these events or programs, it is very, very important uh, that you have a, a post event, a briefing or a review meeting, right? A post event review meeting. Um, some of the things that we do that, that I have done with the team is mentioned in the notes. Um, we we look at um, we don't we don't have anything fancy. We don't call this process. Uh, I mean. Uh, whatever we it's just a post post event review meeting uh, we do uh, post the youth camps youth retreats you uh, combine youth meetings and whatnot um, and so we ask this question like is it good bad missing confusing uh, so for example in good we ask okay what went well um, what were the wins why was this thing a success we talk about it we let the team members talk about it or explain why this was good why what worked uh, and then the bad what went wrong this is i think very important we uh, we need to address uh, in the program of a program of an event of what went wrong what didn't work uh, 
did we try something uh, that failed that will help us you know change our plans for the next meeting um, and then what is missing did we forget anything uh, right and then um, confusing so uh, what what was our goal or purpose for doing this did we accomplish it were we clear in our communication did everyone get the point of what we were trying to do okay um, so these are some of the things that we ask ourselves uh, as post event um, I think this is very important crucial it will um, um, help you guys as well uh, any questions or any thoughts so far Okay, all right. Uh, so, and and the depth. This the, another point is the depth in spiritual discipleship. Um, you know, youth meetings should not just be a place of uh, where uh, of get together and just have a have you know uh, fun and whatnot. All of that is important. I, I sound so bad when I say youth meeting should not be a place of fun, right? All of that is important, but uh, get togethers can happen anywhere. Anybody can have a get together, you know, bunch of groups and whatnot. Um, and, um, and I think it's very important that while we have fun and fellowship and whatnot, we should never miss the focus on spiritual discipleship. That is the whole point of it all, is that never forget that you are a shepherd. Right, uh, having a shepherd's heart uh, for for the people that you're leading is extremely crucial. Guiding them, leading them, providing for them, protecting them, and you know, providing in terms of spiritual dis uh, uh, teaching, biblicals, and sound teaching is very very important. Uh, and if you have your leaders, your core team leaders, and your and even us as leaders, we should keep remembering, uh, reminding ourselves that. We are a shepherd and not a star, because uh, again, uh, I think it's, I don't know what it is about this day and age, which is very easy to become a celebrity shepherd. Uh, you, you saying right? Um, it's it's very easy for for fame or success or you know people genuinely celebrating you can get to your head and think okay you're a star now and somewhere it is possible for us to lose a picture that we are still a shepherd we still continue to lead you know um, uh, lead them with the shepherd's heart right so everything to do with uh, pastoring comes out of the shepherd's heart uh, because the shepherd exists uh, for the sheep the sheep don't exist uh, you know for the shepherd kind of a thing but uh, we continue to you know thrive for them I love this quote by Tom Crandall, who used to be the, uh, I think, who heads the youth ministry in Bethel Church at the wedding. Uh, he says, if we don't give the next generation an encounter with God, there won't be a generation to carry the kingdom of God. Okay, that's, uh, that's again, it's, he's using Ju Judges chapter 2, verse 10 in his own words. That if we don't give the next generation an encounter with God, there won't be a generation to carry the kingdom of God. Right? Um, and so, again, with everything that we've been learning and how can we continue to do so, uh, is one of a couple of things that we emphasized I, I, in our youth ministry at APC is setting a culture. Uh, because if a culture is not set for you, um, uh, if you don't set a culture, sorry, uh, the culture will be set for you. Right? And so the culture that you are creating is the culture that you allow. For a successful youth ministry, a culture is very crucial. Uh, now, culture is very crucial for, uh, again, any organization, a uh, school, institution, uh, workplace, whatever, the culture is important. Uh, what kind of a culture are you setting? Um, it could be positive, negative. Uh, you know, in in even at homes, it's very important. Like there's culture of uh, family prayer. 
the culture of no gossip, uh, the culture of no, uh, you know, no whatever, backbiting or whatever you want to call it. Um, or all of those things can exist and that can be the culture at, you know, at any place. There is no culture of family prayer. There is no culture of, uh, uh, there is the culture of gossip that everybody gossips about everybody, um, etc., etc. Right, so you get what I'm saying. So it is very important to ask yourself again, what culture is your ministry uh, allowing? Because the culture that you are creating is the culture that you allow. And so uh, we had to, again, uh, uh, there is no such thing as over communicating. Uh, we had to put in a few points to say, OK, these are the things that we want to see as a culture amongst our youth or youth ministry overall, right? Um, and so one of the first point is uh, uh, the come as you are, that everybody is accepted. Uh, nobody will be judged uh, for how they look, uh, what they wear, uh, or what their past is, uh, you know, what, what they have done, their sins or mistakes or whatnot. Um, because with so many options that are available for young people, it is important that as a youth ministry, uh, we commit to a creating a culture where young people can come as they are and feel safe, right? Regardless of what problems and uh, whatnot, right? So, uh, be being intentional about creating a culture of acceptance, a culture where young people can walk in from wherever and can simply be themselves. Um, this was very crucial. Um, it, uh, see uh, again. Some of these points are birthed out of, I wish I had all these things existed in the days when I was a youth, when I was being led uh, by the youth leaders uh, and whatnot. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, uh, no, you know, there was this thing where, um, and I'm not going to mention the leaders' names, obviously, or the church names. I'm just saying all of these things were missing uh, in in a church where there was youth ministry uh, and where I was as where I was the youth there I, you know I, I, there was this constant tension of um, a fear of how uh, how I was looked upon or judged for the way I look because I'm talking about almost 18 years ago uh, I had a little long hair and uh, looked a little bit more rebellious <laughs> uh, but yeah, so uh, coming as you are, letting young people know that they can come just as they are, how, who, you know, whoever they are and who they are, they can come, they are welcomed, is very important. And you are teaching your team members that. And you're, in turn, your team members are talking to the young people as, you know, we are creating this culture and then, you know, every and everybody feels welcomed. Okay, so uh, come as you are, and encouragement uh, was is another key. The, uh, creating a culture of encouragement, um, right? Because uh, in the world where people focus on tearing others down in just a comment, uh, you know, it was very important that we be a ministry where we build people. Okay, uh, just remember, you know, you remember this instance in John chapter eight uh, about stoning of women caught in the act of adultery. Uh, you know, everybody took up their stones. In this day and age, we don't literally take us uh, the stones up. We are, but we are, you know, uh, in many ways we do that with our comments or, uh, you know, it's very easy. You get what I'm saying, right? It's very metaphoric nowadays. In a day and age where it's very easy for us to bring people down, tear them down, hurt them. Uh, let us be a ministry and create a culture where we can build people, right? And so, uh, and that happens with the culture of encouragement. Uh, a word of encouragement to someone on a day that they are being discouraged, it's like an oxygen to them or another lifeline to them. You just help them get through that day, uh, you know, that. They, when they've ha when they're going through a very hard time, so having a culture of encouragement is very important. Uh, and the third thing is uh, communicating your why is very crucial. Communicating your why, and your audience eventually will know why you are doing what you are doing is crucial. 
okay so when people know why you do what you do they can lean in and own it with even more conviction okay uh, why are you creating this culture why are you doing this why are you doing this event why are you doing this program uh, and so when your why becomes clear uh, you have uh, you know you uh, you have their um, their undivided attention okay so simply because we have very limited time with our youth uh, every week uh, so we we have to make it count so creating a culture of knowing the why and then finally you are creating a culture of commitment um, commitment is key um, you know you, and that starts with both ways um, when when your youth sees that you are being committed like n no matter what uh, you know you are again building a culture now uh, when the pandemic hit uh, you know in 2020 uh, as most ministries we all went online as well including youth ministry and so for a, two years two years right um, two years or so uh, every Friday from the third week of March 2020 the third week of March 2020 till uh, when till the end November 2022 every Friday we would meet for uh, we, we had online youth meetings now the numbers increased they would drop the attendees would increase you know the number of participants would increase and drop increase and drop increase and drop but uh, sometimes it can just be it'll only be the the core team that is uh, that is attending the youth meeting uh, but what was important is that you would continue to do that you you will continue to show and display uh, that you know that you are committed to what you are doing uh, you know after the program after the youth meeting you would share the notes with the, all the youths and whatnot so everybody knows that the meeting happened and eventually what that instills is that it instills in your youth to be committed now they will be committed to you know attend the programs or serve in the church and whatnot okay so uh, under commitment uh, the the two things that we looked at uh, was um, that is yeah one is com commitment and the other is them being part of a community okay uh, I think this is pretty huge uh, you know when it comes to the context of youth ministry and young people wanting to be part of a community there's a couple of questions that we need to ask is uh, why we need why why is building a community um, important um, and there are multiple scriptures in the Bible that for us that we can read in Romans 12 4 to 5 says just as our bodies have many parts and each are, each part has a special function so it is with Christ's body we are many parts of one body but we all belong to each other um, and um, some scriptures in Proverbs that I like in Proverbs 11 14 15 22 and 24 6 it says but in the multitude of counselors there is safety uh, but in the multitude of counselors they are established and in the multitude of counselors again there is safety so um, so community is God's idea uh, you know it began when he said it is not good for a man to be alone it kind of starts there and again instilling instilling this culture of commitment and this culture of community and being part of community is very crucial um, now I, I want to share with. Uh, do you all have your notes with you guys? Your your PDF. Yes, faster, faster. Yeah. Okay. So if you look at if you go to page thirty three, right? Uh, if you're there, okay. Page thirty three. Um, so you um, you'll see an image with numbers, simple addition. Kind of a thing. Yes, 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 Pastor. Okay, Avani has it. Kung has it. Everybody else has it. Because I, I, I'm going to ask you this a simple question. Feel free to unmute your mic and uh, speak. Okay, everybody there, looking at the same page. I, I hope you are. Let me. Uh, 
me actually try and share it so that the way that way everybody can look at okay cool everybody looking at this right cool um so yeah what what stands out for you in this it's a test for you guys so uh you tell me oh. It's not a tricky question, okay, by the way. It's a very simple test. <laughs> Some of you are like sweating. It's like, oh, mathematics, no. Avni, what do you think? Mangi? Rose? Sir. Four plus two. Yeah, go ahead, Elijah. Not equal to Four plus two is not okay. equal to seven. Right, right, okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, okay. Thanks, Elisha. Okay. What else? What, what about the others? Mangi? Avni? Uh, I think it should be... Uh... First number is three. It should be a, in, a, in a sequence, so it should be three, four, five, six, and the uh, second number should be one, two, three, four, and then accordingly the num number should add up. No, no, Christopher, it's not that complicated at all, Christopher. It's a very simple thing. <laughs> There's no sequence in us. <laughs> okay. Uh, anything else? Anyone else? Avni or Sai? Anyone Googling it? It's not worth Googling and all, guys. OK. <laughs> what I see is plus the 3 plus 1, 4. Okay. 4 plus 1, 5 is right. Then okay. they are adding the, okay. the top 4, and the 5 okay. with diagonally 2, and then 7, and then. Uh... Yeah, no, Avni, it's not complicated. Like... <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Uh, just stop sharing. Okay, good. Um, see the now we are all talking about com building community, isn't it? Uh, one of the reasons why uh, why we have to build community or reach out to people is because God loves people, uh, and you know, pe it's the people that make up a community or a Christ-centered community. Um, now, everybody's answer is right, right? Everybody said four plus two is uh, is not seven; it's six. Nobody said, uh, you know, that there are three that are right. And everybody pointed out the one thing that was wrong. Nobody said there is three that is correct. So, so what, what, what we're trying to say is it is very easy. Uh, I think it's very natural for us as human beings to see a flaw in someone and then leave the rest of the good part right um so uh, you get what i'm saying right the dust is the dust is available everywhere on the road it's right there or right on top right the dirt is right on the surface but if you want the diamond uh, we need to dig deep isn't it? There is a there is a diamond in every individual, and for that which we just can't see, uh, you know, by in their face value and whatnot. So, and that is part of being building a Christ-centered community is looking beyond their surface level shortcomings. Everybody has shortcomings. Everybody has flaws, uh, isn't it? It is very easy to look at that one mistake, that one wrong thing, and they completely ignore the three that is correct, right? Uh, how did we learn this? How did we come to this point? Um, and so it's very important that as we lead, uh, you know, this youth ministry or any ministry for that matter, um, that 
we build a Christ-centered community. There are a lot of scriptures that I've given for you all in the notes. I would encourage you to do that. So building a culture of acceptance, of encouragement, um, and, uh, and knowing the why is extremely crucial. That would lead to building a culture of commitment and community. Okay? Um, and there are some more scriptures uh, there for you all in the notes. And um, and because all, I'm, I'm trying to combine the chapter 6 ending and with chapter 7 as well, because uh, when you, when the young people see that you are committed, that, that you are going after, that you are pursuing God, uh, His presence, His love, uh, with all your passion and zeal and uh, with, uh, with full of fire, uh, that cannot be ignored by the people that you are leading and they will want to be just like you right they will want to be just like you and that is how you also ignite passion among the youth is simply by uh you know you you you, you be the culture that you want to see you as a leader be the culture or being the culture that you want to see and then people eventually see and see how passionate you are and um, how full of fire and zeal you are for God. And then they will follow you in, in everything um, that you do. Okay. And uh, I mean, some of the questions that you can ask yourself is, are you on fire for God, for God's manifest presence? Uh, is your heart burning for the fire of his holiness? Uh, you know, are you on fire for evangelism? Is your heart you know, is your, your heart burning to reach the lost? Uh, are you, are you, is your heart going after, you know, the wonder and the beauty of His holiness and to see Jesus and displaying His majesty to the rest of the world? Are you displaying all of that for the young people to see? Um, you know, again, it's not just that you do one thing on the stage for them to see and live a different life. That's not what you get. What we are saying, right? What I'm saying is. Um, all your ministry, what you're leading, should be an overflow of what you do in the secret. And so, you know, when everything that you do right in the secret place with him, um, everything else becomes uh, easy, leading, creating a culture to building a community, a Christ-centered community and uh, whatnot. Yeah, um, I mean, that's about what I had to share. Um, any, any thoughts that you all have? First, I have, I have a question on uh, yeah. on allowing everyone to come as they are. Yeah. Not back from say like come as you are and and Jesus. You, if it, yeah, uh, we couple of couple of months back we uh, in, in in our local church we had we have the same policy come as you are and then. Uh, by God's grace or God's willing, you get saved. However, uh, people, young people coming in 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 the youth meeting with uh, intent to sell drugs and uh, easily, uh, uh, drug culture is easily spread among our our youth. Okay. Um, so, question I have, Pastor: uh, yes. How do you? manage or how do you control or how do you uh, look after your youth so to, to avoid things like that to happen yeah so now again this is about uh, so the, you, there's two ways of looking at it Mangi and the way I would look at it this is how I would look at it anybody else is free to share uh, their thoughts is one is uh, when I say come as you are I'm looking at an individual right and you know when I, Jesus dined with sinners. Uh, Luke, the Gospel of Luke is another uh, tagline, so to say, for the Gospel of Luke is as Jesus, the friend of sinners. Now, every time Jesus met with a sinner, he empowered the sinner to live a holy life. Right, and that's the that's the point of all of this. When you say "come as you are," you are accepting them as they come in individually with their past and sin and whatnot, and but then you know, you empower them 
to live a better life as a Christian. Okay, so that that's your heart for them, and then uh, you know there can be individuals where you know come in with an intention to uh, say um, do things like what you just mentioned. Your other responsibility as a shepherd is also to guard them and protect them, uh, and uh, and so I would have a talk with my leadership with my senior pastor and get it into his uh, notice uh, as well and and you know seek his counsel as well and his wisdom as to how we can best handle the situation in the context of your church in the context of the culture of your community and whatnot so um that's how i would approach this whole thing Maggie, is uh keeping my pastor or senior pastor in the loop about this thing as well is very crucial so uh, and this can happen in any different situations and that there's one happening right now in our church which i don't want to mention but yeah uh, having the leadership involved in the decision making of how to protect uh, your uh, your flock is very important yeah, yeah. Uh, christopher yes um, yeah, I just wanted to confirm, Pastor, is this the last class we're having for this course? Yes, Christopher. Right. Yeah, so I, I was just going reading through chapter 7, and my initial sort of, uh, uh, you know, trying, trying to understand the word passion and how it relates to, to suffering also. Yeah. Um, and uh, never, never really, uh, uh, you know, um, I mean, it's the first time I've heard this actually. Okay. So, um, um, so maybe you could just explain that to us a little bit, please, and also, sure. uh, well, you know, what I mean, how do you how do you view the the movie Passion of Christ? Uh, because I mean, there are some sort of conflicting views of you know that that movie also. So, just want to oh. get thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. So uh, again, now, um, a passion. I, I, if you just look at the dictionary definitions that's mentioned there is uh, is a strong and barely controllable emotion intense enthusiasm and all of that is great but then it comes from this root latin word uh it simply means passio uh, means uh, to suffer long suffering long suffering right and so uh, and this week uh, is called the passion week for a reason the last week where you know the week where jesus is you know, crucified and whatnot. So this week is known as the Passion Week. Uh, um, and so how it relates to us in our ministry and whatnot is uh, when we say I'm passionate about this ministry, uh, it's, a, it's, it's yes, it is a, your enthusiasm towards the young people and whatnot. But then, you know, we go back to one of the points that we learned is you looking at this ministry or the chat uh, as that in from a marathon kind of a perspective. So when you think, uh, you know, be because of all this uh, enthusiasm and excitement and whatnot that you want to invest into the young people's lives, and when you don't see that happening immediately, uh, you can get discouraged and and you know end your ministry thing very prematurely. But is having this heart, understanding that okay, passion is all of this enthusiasm and excitement and whatnot, and also it means you know long suffer. You know, suffer long is okay. Be patient. Just, just go on with this. Like it says, love is long suffering, isn't it? Um, so that's the whole perspective of it. And um, you know, I, I like the movie, The Passion of Christ, just as is. Uh, I haven't been too critical about it, but I don't want to comment too much on that, Christopher. I like the movie. I just watch it for what it is. The way he's trying to communicate it. I know they can get into a lot of nitty gritty stuff. But I see it for what it is, and I'm okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I guess I. Um, I mean, just sort of coming back to that. Uh, that you know, so the passion is always you know viewed in the in the traditional sense. Yes. And um, uh, you know, suffering. So maybe it's I don't know. But suffering means um, you know kind of long long suffering and uh, you know yes. endurance. Yes, uh, which is which probably makes sense, but yes, um, when you relate it to the passion of Christ, which is mm. which is so amazingly, I mean, that is, I mean, I would say that was that is really suffering, right. uh, yeah. So, I mean, in the, in the true sense of the word, I mean, and yeah. I would say that is intense suffering, yes. So, um, and he did that because of his love for us, isn't it? 
that because of the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. That's what the Bible says, isn't it? Okay, hey everyone. Well, yeah, thank you. I hope you all have learned something about youth ministry in this course. As I said, uh, it's uh, kind of a short course, uh, slightly intense, but uh, and I hope that you can genuinely carry something and apply it in your area of ministry. And uh, and as you all know, I'm anytime you want to reach out to me, my email is available. It's the same thing at portion.jonas. Uh, feel free to write to me anytime okay uh, god bless you do your assignment well i'm looking forward to reading your uh, reviews book reviews take it guys god bless you bye thank you so much sir thank you so take much take it's been a bye. pleasure it's been a pleasure to me too thank you Thank you, Pastor.